else will be in and done by then. So having the, we'll have the presentation of the results that evening, and we would like you there with the idea that our board members would join you at the tables to discuss the findings. So that's, that's what we're going to do, is invite you to put that on your agenda and hope that, uh, hope that you can attend. So with that, if you have to use the restrooms in our new, new place, uh, right down this hallway is where you'd want to go. And there's, uh, because this was the Minnesota School of Business, it's a, it's like a very large bathroom to <laughs> use. So uh, right down the hallway there is where you'll, you'll find the restrooms. And with that, uh, tonight I would like to have us kick off with uh, Angela Tucker, one of our school board members, is here to do a welcome uh, and, and a greeting. So, Angela? secondary science system. So if you we're going to be going into it just a moment about some of the work that you did last time and how that developed into our statements of consultation, which I believe about half of you went online and provided further comments to help bring that bring that all together. But that's really the role is, is to help provide feedback from your viewpoint uh, to the board and as you, you, all of us here will operate and can operate out of self-interest. What we're asking to do as a guiding coalition is, is to operate, as you did last time, out of what's the, what's the district interest. The guiding coalition isn't to, is not intended to be a collection of all of just individual views, but a collection of a community that says, we'll come together with district interest in mind for all the kids, the entire community. And sometimes that might coincide with your individual view, and sometimes it might contradict your individual view, and that's what makes it fun. Uh, the second thing is to try to have a coalition that represents broad array of views. So my hope is that at your tables, you will uh, be affirmed and also be challenged by people who might have different views, different experiences than you do. And again, we ask you as a guiding coalition, um, please listen, listen well, try to understand. It's not a matter of convincing one another or winning an argument. It's about understanding each other's viewpoints, reality, experiences, and say, given all this, what do we think we should do? What advice should we give? And uh, as Angela said, it does place the board in a unique position to be able to have a broad group to say, you might want to think about this. And I would offer that your, your comments that you made last time uh, were both general and broad-based, and some of them were quite specific. And I think good, good uh, council statements of consultation um, engage in that. Um, we are this, I'm just going to go through a little bit uh, the flow of the evening tonight before we get into your statements. We're just going to review the statements and see if there's any questions of clarification from the last meeting. But for this meeting, what we're going to do is take the 12 tables and just have a first uh, uh, a deep dive, having uh, each of four tables take a student view, group of tables take a parent view, group of tables take the public view, 
and, re and develop some two or three key statements at the table. And then we're going to put all of them up here. And then the entire group will work through each of you. So you're like just doing some draft statements, and then everybody will work on all of them. Okay? And um, we're, we're going to do that. And you can see that's going to be a good portion of time. And then we're going to have, after that, we're going to have uh, an update. Uh, uh, the public opinion newspaper and the referendum voter profile and then we're going to talk about the potential impact of that on your statement. So we hope that we kind of like two runs at statements of consultation and again we'll do like we did last time, we'll gather all the feedback, we'll frame some statements up, we'll put them up on the, the web and, uh, and allow you to go online and to provide some edits. I greatly appreciate the people who had the opportunity and time to do that last time because it was very helpful. So, we take a look at, um, I believe, did I hand them? I have them. Okay, let's hand them out. Just as a way of orientation, as you kind of look through these, there's a, you'll see a, a statement up here, and then you'll say this. So the top statement where it says one with the circle, that's both the output from the October 6th <coughs> plus the feedback uh, from the from the group, the people that participated. And I would offer you this: is that the people that came back and provided um, input, back feedback. What we found is that. The vast majority of the feedback was extremely similar in terms of please change this, I don't know what this means. So what was nice is we got really um, similar feedback. So where it says one up above, that's that's the statement going to the board. And then down below you have all the individual statements that came from the table work and, the, and all the points that were up on the wall, remember? So one was about the academic and technology recommendations appear to work. And then you have some things about key issues for implementation. And then on the back, you have the actual feedback. On the next page, you have statements of consultation on amenities. And there were three statements that are being forwarded. And again, the guidance coalition, the meeting, and then the member survey responses. On the third page, you have one versus two mascots with four statements. And finally, on the last page, um, I'm sorry, yeah, two more. The fourth is the uh, cost threshold of election timing. And the fifth was options flexibility and median enrollment beyond 10 years. So again, in each one of these, you'll have at the top of the page the statement. Then down below, if you're going to have the detail from the October 6th meeting, as well as what was online in the survey. So just a reminder, as we go through our work tonight, we'll be looking at parent, public, and student. And then you'll see a, a similar format put back up and say, if you want to have any comments on this, please comment. And we'll leave that up for um, a week or so. Questions? If not, table discussion. So, take a, what we're going to do is uh, take a look at student view, parent view, <coughs> public view. Everybody will have an opportunity to work on free, but we want to kind of like get a good starting point. So your role is to get a good starting point. So I'm going to ask the tables one through four uh, take a look at the student view. So from the view of students, as you look at these four options that you've been studying. So tables one through four. Put on your student hat. <laughs> or imagine from a student's view. How would a student look at options one through four? 
what comments, what statements would they make? And if you're going, I have no idea, then you might want to ask a student. <laughs> what do you think would be a good idea? <laughs> Tables five through eight, if you could take the parent view. And tables 9 through 12, if you can take the public view. And again, uh, as I said, uh, as just as a guideline about statements of, uh, statements of consultation, statements of consultation is to help the board and the superintendent in their choice making and decision making. Think of the best way I found to think about it is think about it as, as, as a coaching, statements of coaching things that they need to consider. Much like you did, you can use a lot of these statements as, as, a, as a sample point of type of language and tone that's helpful, okay? And uh, we have, we'll have a whole bunch of uh, people, they're all raised there, the facilities action team. Stand up, come on. Pat, Scott, Christine. So they're gonna be here uh, to, so that if anybody has any questions as you go through that, ask raise your hand. Oh, and we also have uh, from administration and the board um, are here to both listen and assist. What we'd like you to do is, if you could, take the next 20 minutes. Uh, try to get at least uh, one to three statements. You have sheets of paper in front of you on your tables with some markers. Please use them. Print large. Okay? Any questions? Go ahead. And then the idea is that if you're listening to all these, then what are then what might be we have open discussion about what are some of the key common statements, common themes you're hearing from all the different groups. Okay. If something is read and you don't know what it means, just say author, author. Someone should say, oh, that's what we meant by that phrase. Okay. And you're probably going to hear different viewpoints, which is fine, right? Because not all students are going to look at each of the options the same way. And some of, some of the tables said we just made broad statements across all the options. They didn't split it up option by option. So, and Christine and I are going to work together to kind of go through that. Plus, my voice is, is about, you know, 30%, 40% gone. So I might be fading out here in 15 minutes. So, ready? Yeah. All right. So. One high school from a perspective, students get lost, a loss of relationship with teachers, fewer opportunities to participate in sports teams and clubs, more academic opportunities. All right, option one, add to the current. Concern for loss of athletic fields, lack of opportunity for extracurriculars, less individual attention with 3,200 students in one building, overcrowding, travel time within a large building. Then I'm going to go down to here, which is, um, says additional 1,600 students to existing. How will the logistics work for students to get around the campus? How will opportunities be afforded to kids if there's only one set of programs, sports, music, theater, etc.? Would students have enough to park with the increase of students? And how would the construction impact current student sessions? For one high school, uh, two campuses, what would the school day look like? Yep. So the, uh, a new 3,200 student building, uh, crowded, same concern as adding 1,600 to the current high school. 
So how, if you just listen, these are just all the one, one high school, right? What were some of the themes you just heard in the last two minutes? Getting lost. Okay, getting lost. I mean, like, will you really get lost in a big high school? I mean, to the students. <laughs> they get lost in the like tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't make my afternoon classes, I got lost. <laughs> no, but okay, big size, right? Get lost. What's another other key themes that you heard from this? I think that loss of relationship with the teacher, so you wouldn't have a teacher um, for the whole year, you might have one semester, and then you have all these others, so you've never really developed um, deep relationships and connections. Okay. We have a student over here that had a comment. Parking. Is that a parking? Not enough. Well, it get really crowded. Because if you have everyone coming to school in the car, it'll be a lot. So you think about it. I'm just trying to. We'll we'll start taking notes, but from a student's view, this is. Big, getting lost, big, less deep relationships, more people, fewer relationships, larger scale, fewer parking spots. Less opportunities for extra curriculum. Yep, and that's another, less opportunities for extracurriculars. Like four key themes. And we can come back to this, but you get the sense of what we're doing? which is why I'm gonna encourage you to kind of focus in and listen, because you're listening to a lot of different uh, ideas from different groups. <coughs> Two high schools, uh, student perspective, splitting friends, <coughs> equality of programs and facilities, more opportunities for participation, and with the uh, two high schools, a fear, a lack of student support for this plan. Yeah. And two high schools, two mascots. Uh, what would the school day look like? All options should be looked at from the lens of the students that it will impact when they have the mega school here. Which is not related. Okay, so that's two high schools, two mascots, and then here's two campuses, one school. Scheduling issues, transportation. transportation Popular choice among students, two buildings, one mascot, would ease crowding and class travel with smaller buildings. Travel time. And then over here, a group did, I'm just gonna read through this because some of this impacts. Um, student, uh, short term versus long term. There's a big change initially with a minimal impact long term. More difficult for parents, long term. More difficult for students, short term. That's across all this change. That's why I'm reading this. Large buildings may be overwhelming to students. Concern about disruption created by the construction. And equity between schools could be difficult to manage. Student population, teachers, and class offerings. So we thought we'd give you that because it's so, because it uh, impacts both. So, let's just take a look at the the uh, the two high schools, two mascots. Again, the splitting of friends, equality of programs and facilities, more opportunities, fear of lack of student for this plan. And then you've got the two campuses, one school. So, what are you hearing about the two campuses? Key things. Yeah, equity. <coughs> equity in facilities, equity in programming. So equity between two. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Other key things. And there will be a big initial change with students. Yep. Yeah. They'll get to the point where that's what they know. Right. So it's a, it's a big change, shorter term students, longer term adults. Kind of same thing when you change boundaries. Fun thing to do. 
the kids adapt the quickest. Other key themes. There'd be more teams, more opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's not really, that's not brought up here, but. More opportunities. Oh, here's, okay, within the more opportunities, specifically within teams. Okay, thank you. Others? Splitting up the kids. Pardon me? Splitting up the kids. The splitting of the kids. A big problem. A big problem. Because even though the community, the kids see themselves as? One. One. I think from our table, that's, that's short term. Short term, that's a big problem. Long term, 12 years from now, no one will know there was one high school. Mm -hmm. that, comment, that comment was made here by AP. He's a ninth grader at East West. West. And when they first had the two junior highs, everybody was up in arms about the student play. Because the next year, there were no issues. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. They got over it. And that goes along with what we said, which was whatever the options are, they need to be looked at through the eyes of the students who they will impact, not the students of today or the students of yesterday. Did everybody hear that? So, so there's a couple comments over here about the, from experience from a student, is that some of these transitions the students get over, deal with quite quickly. And the other was that this, the viewpoint should be looked at through the viewpoint of the students who are coming into the system not the students who have left the system, but the ones that are coming in. Maybe we should just have all the adults go to school. <laughs> that was a joke, attempt at humor. But we're going to come back to these, but we're just trying to get, uh, again, one high school, big, may get lost, parking challenges, fewer opportunities for extracurriculars. Two and two, equity is an issue between two high school buildings. It's a big change, short-term students, long-term adults. More opportunities, the splitting of students is a concern for the short-term. All should be viewed from the student who will be at the school in the future. You see how we take all these sheets and all of a sudden, here's some key statements starting to emerge. Make sense? By the way, a lot of times when you do all this work, when you bring it together, um, we've had groups that go, geez, when you boil it down, the statements of consultation end up getting shorter and just to the point. And that, that, allows, that allows the board and the superintendent to gain a little bit. They, some of them may hold these views, they may have an insight, and sometimes they haven't thought about it in that way. Okay, should we go on? Okay, parent view. So we've got the two high schools, one, two high schools, two, <coughs> one and one, right? So should we go in the same sequence? But we got a lot of, all of this is parents' view. <laughs> <laughs> so why would that be? <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we had six tables do this one. <laughs> uh, let's start with this because the, the one, the one. So parent view, one high school, one mascot, a new high school. So the new high school, so they did both add to the current and new. So add to the current, short term fix, complicated to move sports complex, not at high school, complicated to have sports complex, not high school, one half of the cost of the larger high school complex. Okay. Okay, one high school, one mascot, new high school, uh, costly, too big, not as much opportunity for varsity athletics, better opportunities to compete with uh, other districts, more opportunities for co-curriculars. A, a pair of you for a single <coughs> large school, cost, student travel time between classes, lack of extracurricular <coughs> opportunities. Okay, down here, we've got uh, one big high school. Uh, my kid will get lost. Uh, will last well over 10 years with option for expansions, more opportunities for kids, such as clubs, cost issue, fields at site. And then in addition to the current, so still one high school, disruption during construction, how will travel to sports fields disrupt learning, practices, and safety concerns? <coughs> Uh, parent 
parents agree it will be uh, full in or before 10 years. Uh, parents agree uh, things need to happen quick. Parents on committee don't want to be associated with this option 10 years from now. <laughs> I work it. We have a whole bunch of names on the <laughs> we, won't, we won't have that in the report. <laughs> There's probably things here people haven't thought about, right? So what are some consistent themes here about one, one high school? Cost too much. Right, and that's for the whole loop. Right, <coughs> just for building the new high school. For building the whole new high school, cost so that you might want to just the whole the new high school yeah. cost too much. Okay? okay. Other comments about the one whole new high school or the addition? It's too large. Too large. On both, too large. More opportunities. Okay. More opportunities. <laughs> then on the flip side, we heard not as much opportunity for sports. Right. But so way more competitive. <coughs> yeah, you, have, you have more opportunities and you have less opportunity. Uh, so you're kind of like Well, you're, you're, because you see it differently, right? Didn't it say something about flexibility or use of space or something with the one? Flexibility? I don't. Or Flexibility use of space. space or Could be added on. Oh, yeah. Uh, one versus two mascots. Uh, one. Yeah, no, we haven't, got, we haven't gotten there yet. But on the, the, the one high school, you're saying flexibility? Oh, in the orange. Okay. Yeah. In the you orange? Lots well over 10 years without. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, more flexibility for expansion. Yes. Okay. For long term. For long term. For one high school? No, for the one, one new high school. school. A new high school provides more opportunities for expansion. You can also put all the fields yeah. yeah. And I think one thing you heard here uh, that I think was up here was about travel time. On the addition, travel time to the other for sports for the other fields, right? The one that on the addition, yeah. On the addition. So on the addition, the concern feedback is about travel time. All right, so let's go to the two high schools, in which we've got about uh, 10. So uh, two high schools, one mascot, keep the community whole. Lots of transportation students and teachers. Tempor temporary or long term? All right, uh, less extracurricular opportunities, too many moving parts, Difficult to set up. Will kids have equal academic opportunities? Again, two campuses, one mascot. Logistics, how will it work? Less chance of student getting lost or falling through cracks. It is weird. <laughs> Benefits of two schools making connections. Adults get their one mascot. <laughs> one versus two mascots. One, uh, cost, uh, less money, best chance, most likely option. Uh, option flexibility. We have one high school, add two buildings, etc., but still one high school. And amenities, county, state, district should work hand by hand with extra spaces and academics and technology equity across all buildings. So that's a, the, for the two high schools, one mascot. Should, do you just want to do this or should we go to the 2-2? Two, two? The 2-2 two, two, like we did before. Um, not enough kids to participate <coughs> at varsity level. Will there be inequities? Segregation culturally and economically. Okay. Uh, divides community. Gives twice the opportunity. Future parents may wonder why so close. Two campuses, two mascots, more extracurricular opportunities. What will happen to the learning environment because of the competition? The possibility of have and have nots. Okay, that's an academic plan one. 
And just so we know that, uh, there was a parent view across all concerns about teachers being able to implement ILPs in individual learning plans in any option. So that was just a broad. So <coughs> comments and themes about two high schools in the parent's view, all of these. Equity. Equity. Pardon me? Equity between, Equity between the two. Other key themes. Equity between the two, and yet divides the community. <laughs> there would be more opportunities <laughs> based on you know, more twice as many teams, twice as many. Right. So there are, there are more opportunities, <coughs> but you can see some of these, right? You can look at the the, the assessment, and if there's some pluses, and there's some minuses, right? As there will be with all of these. There'd be room for growth in 10 years. Room for growth? Other statements? Okay. Should keep rolling? So then we have a public view. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, just, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, yeah. <coughs> She's been sitting there, I don't know, this whole time, they've been over here. So, addition to the current. All right, lack of future flexibility, athletic facilities off-site uh, inconvenient, awkward use of space. The new 3200 building, too expensive. Why didn't they do this 10 years ago? <laughs> Good flexibility for future, not centrally located for the community. Right. And then we move on to two high schools. So let's just, because we've been doing this in this way, um, I, I, there is, <coughs> there's one that is not um, specific. And it says, regardless of the plan, each student should have their own device. What? Regardless of the plan, each student should have their own digital device. One-to-one -one learning. Yep. Okay. And the public wants unity with one school and mascot. Okay. So if we just take a look at the addition to the current, because the, these others are for two schools. Um, lack of future flexibility, athletic facilities, awkward use of space with two buildings, too expensive. Why didn't they do this 10 years ago? Where are their names? <laughs> um, good flexibility for the future, not centrally located. And we only ended up having two teams do this because we collapsed, which is why we have far fewer cards here. Ooh. Yeah, we have lack of flexibility and flexibility. Figure that one out. Okay. The addition. Yeah. So the addition presents lacks of future flexibility where the building new building has flexibility, which actually is consistent, right? That is consistent view across. So what I'd like you to do, we're gonna we're gonna go through there isn't a couple cards, so We'll get some more here. We're gonna go through these two and then I'm gonna have you do some work at your tables, okay? Because you can start seeing what's coming up here. Uh, for two schools, one mascot. Trust that it will remain one mascot. Addition, to, addition talk from original school. Mm -hmm. Author, author. <laughs> when, when it was originally, when, when this current building was built, everybody heard that they could Okay. So that, that, yeah. would, that, would, that, that would make people happy from that first one. Okay. Are we understand that? Let's I think we're gonna we're gonna hyphen that. We'll call that addition time. <laughs> Maintains identity of the community, again to school and mascot, able to compete at the highest level, connection relationships. For two school two mascots. 
too expensive, has hidden costs, splitting the community, not competing sports, or opportunities, building proximity to close connection and relationships with staff and students. So what's some of the key, just with these, I know there's like two cards, but two schools. I might have, I might have heard it on the parent view too, but there's some talk of being able to compete with the larger schools, and the counter argument is the opportunity yeah. with the smaller schools. Yeah, so you have, if, if I, and maybe this is not framed well, competition with others versus opportunities within. Yes. And that's a... On some particular sports. sports. And I think that it's not true for all. Right, and there could be more opportunities on some sports that we don't offer because now there's a bigger pool of kids mm -hmm. that might be able to play. But on some sports, clearly, that wouldn't be that way. Right. So you have to be cautious of a blank about big statements because it's complex, right? How about for others? Can I ask a question of that, um, the one that you're about, you're touching that number six on the far right? Connection relationships with staff and students. Yeah, was that schools. a positive or a negative? Was that saying that they wouldn't have it or that they would have a better relationship with their school or teachers? This, this was the two and two. That's a positive. That's a positive. Yeah. The, same with number five. The two, the two schools? Yeah. Two schools would have better connections. Oh, to okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So that's a threat then, for both. Mm -hmm. So threat for both is, is is the connection and relationships with teachers and students. Could, could somebody explain that to me? I mean, I understand if you've got a 3,500 student high school, the principal is probably not going to know everybody's name right. as much. But you're still going to have, I'm assuming, relatively the same class size, the same number of teachers. Why would that be different? I don't know, I didn't write these, but I interpret it as because in a smaller school you're more likely going to have a teacher again or from one semester to the next versus... If you're, if you're in the engineering program, there's probably fewer teachers that teach engineering in a smaller school, so you'll probably, that teacher would have to teach different classes at different grade levels, so that student would probably have that teacher right. maybe twice and get to know them better, whereas in a larger school, you know, you, you're going to have a, a bigger pool of teachers to pick from, mm -hmm. and there's less of a chance that they would have that teacher again. And I don't and know about the downside of making connections with multiple teachers. What's that? What's the downside of making connections with multiple teachers throughout your high school career? I don't know if there's necessarily a downside, but if you do make a connection in ninth grade with a teacher and then never see them again in class wise, I think that's maybe what is being I was just going to say, sometimes it's hard to, like you made the comment, why would it be bad to get to know more teachers? When those teachers know how you learn, they can more effectively teach you. When those things get set up, I mean, theoretically, if there was a larger school, I mean, you might be in pods or you might do some things to try to draw upon the strengths of a smaller unit even if you're in that large environment. So while globally there might be those concerns, but there are strategies to address things like that, correct? I mean, theoretically, if you had to go with an approach like that and that was what was selected, you could implement some things to mitigate that. True? So, well, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go back. I think, I'm gonna try to clarify. I think the original, one of the original points you're trying to make is large or small, aren't they gonna have staffing is turned by the number of students? <coughs> so large or small, Per kid, you're gonna put the same amount of staff. That was your original, right? And so my question would be: Does that make? Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Because <laughs> we use staff by student ratios, so the number of adults pretty much are the same. And then you're getting into: But is the environment different, or do you? And I think the point you're making is: Are the strategies for making a large school small? Are you 
I don't. No. I mean, I think it's already. I don't think it would change. I think I don't know that it would matter if they were at two schools or at one school. I don't think that. Right. Really being married to a teacher and not being a teacher, but hearing all the teacher stories, I get, <laughs> there, are, there are copious number of stories that I get. A lot of things happen in the lunchroom and in the hallway and in passing periods and things like that. And my wife who teaches English, she, at the size of school that we are right now, she's much more likely to know who those kids are as they're walking through the hallway and as they are teaching and as Brittany said, she gets them again. She can teach them much better um, if she already knows who they are and already knows who they are and, and how they learn. And so, but if something is happening in between passing periods, things like that, if she knows the kid or knows someone who knows the kid, then it's much more likely to be able to effectively handle situations and make those connections with the kid positively, negatively, <coughs> that works in a smaller, environment and that's okay. why I think that's really important so it's a, you're what I'm hearing you're, you're grappling with is, is the, the numbers of adults in the schools on a on a racial basis is actually pretty much the same and so there is this this belief or experience about it, that there's advantages in terms of small and then one point was raised but just how do you what are the strategies for making a large school small because you still have the same amount of adults for the same amount of kids. So how do you employ, design? And part of, well, the reason I'm having this is because we're gonna have you go back and discuss these a little bit more at your table. So the other key points of, wait a minute, either from a student's view, a parent view, or a public view. One that's not up there with feed off the engineering example, larger student body may offer more specialized classes. So instead of a general engineering class, maybe you would have a mechanical engineering class or an electrical engineering class. And that would only be offered by a larger student body to allow employment of new types of students. So scale, scale of number of students might allow for differentiation that you might not have in a smaller school. That's what we're More academic opportunities with uh, what? More diverse academic opportunities. More specialized classes. Then that might be helpful maybe just to add that in in terms of special specialized classes because that doesn't, <coughs> I'm not sure that that for his own state. Yes. Just to piggyback on what Brad has said, I, I taught for a while at a very large metro high school and there were a couple issues with just safety as far as like passing periods. Um, it's inevitable fights, things like that happen, um, and no matter how big your school is, but in this, uh, several instances, none of the teachers knew who the kids were, and they actually had to pull teachers in and take out video surveillance and have multiple teachers come in and try to identify the students, because it was such a large student body that it took several days to figure out even who the kids were. So I just wanted to share that experience mm -hmm. with you. Okay. Yeah. Any other key points before we turn it back? Dennis, yeah. I wanted to go back to that last thing we talked about with the specialized classes mm -hmm. and things. I think that could be accomplished in the two campus, one high school model too because you would be drawing from that larger student body, but you right. could. You could design, you could design that, it. in that format. Yes. Could that also be in the Two campuses, two ice. I mean, two. yeah. We we talked about that last yeah. month, I believe, where there could be opportunities for students to take a class. Co it's a very specialized mm -hmm. class. It's not offered offered in one school, and that goes to the equality as well. You could also have traveling teachers. <coughs> no. So one of the things I'm hearing with all this is, you know. Why we're doing this is because we're trying to get all the stuff up here. Each has their advantage, disadvantages. It's the concerns up here because it's really a lot of these things come down to details where it's the school board's responsibility to manage. And when we're talking about 
one large high school, there's ways of managing one large high, high school, school to talk about this. Two high schools, there's ways to manage split community in that. So I think that's well, our job really here, here is to get these concerns out there. To, to get so the that concerns the out. So really evaluate what yeah, is that. So your, your job is not to get down into the weeds and tell the school board how to put the calendar together or the superintendent how to do the calendar. Although, if you had the answer, I think it would be appreciated, right? <laughs> <laughs> But what you might think, and I'm not, I'm using this as an example, so it is not an answer, but as an example. Example, you, and I'm turning back to your tables, you might make a statement about uh, large or small, maximize specialized um, academic opportunities, and the relationship between staff, teachers and students, or staff and students. You might say, whichever, you could say, you could say one does one better or the other, or you could say, here's some things that any design has to, we, we believe should provide for. That gives design consultation versus option consultation, or choosing. So wait a minute, there's some pieces that we just would want to have, just like, I think one, I will make one, not make one, like one of the students, whatever you do, make sure parking is like easy. Um, and that travel times, right? Travel times aren't that far. I was just in a, in a facility the other day, and um, as I drove up and I went, whoa, it took six blocks to go by the facility. And the entrance was on an end end, and we went in the receptionist went, oh, well, you should have parked on the other parking lot. I said, where's that? Well, that's a half mile away. And I went, oh, that's okay. You still got 20 minutes. You should be able to make it. And then I went, oh, I'm not, by the way, it wasn't a high school. But it just kind of, how do you make things? work and be small. So what I'd like you to do, because we've got some student views, some parent views, and some public views, what I'd like you to do is take take 10 or 10, let's just take 10 minutes at your tables, and what I'd like you to do is work on one statement. If you're to have a statement of consultation across all three the board, <laughs> one statement from each of the tables across all three, across all three of you. What's a statement you'd make to the board about this, these high schools and design? So it might be about any one, it might be across to all of them. What would be, if you only think of one thing, what's one thing you want the board to remember? Okay? For each option. For all. Just not for each option. One statement of consultation for each table. Your most important thing. statements here but we wanted to see how this I said well if only I had one thing to say across the three of you so I'm just going to read these and just just listen we'd like a learning environment that fosters relationships equality and a variety of extracurricular and academic opportunities and provides future flexibility in a fast-growing community provide maximum opportunities for students in future years Hire a great PR firm. <laughs> <laughs> this decision will ripple well into the future, so assurance needs to be made that the plan is flexible and accounts for population growth or contraction, as well as changes in educational models, i.e. capacity, capacity <coughs> online learning. We will be serving 3,200 students with any option chosen. So make all options equitable for all students, making sure that students' academics is the main focus. 
A strong public opinion supports student equality and unity at one high school campus. Make sure the referendum passes. <laughs> the future solution has to provide equitable opportunities that foster rich relationships for high school students of the future at all learning levels. Equity, academic opportunity, and assurance of student success are more important than the facilities options. Options must be researched to determine which will produce positive results at the polls. We can make all options work for students through innovative means. And make sure what is put to a vote passes. Tell the whole story, even though there are different opinions on the pros and cons. Ooh. What's the difference between this and the things you have up here? Pardon me? Skip one. I skipped one. Oh, thank you. I was going to say I skipped one. Focus on the best solution for academics for now and the future. Sell it. Okay. No. <laughs> what are some of the key differences between this group from all of you and these? One's a mission statement driven almost on the right. Kind of more the overarching right. directive that we'd like the school board to carry out. We don't tell them how to do that. Those so, other ones talk about the nitty gritty yeah. details. This this was you all rose up and said, wait a minute, if I only can tell you one thing, you're up here. Do this, right? Then this is the detail. That's one way of looking at it, right? What's another view? Differences or similarities that you see between this and this? Hmm? Equality. Yeah, equality, equity, keep <coughs> coming through, yeah. whatever you do. Opportunity. Don't have winners and losers. Opportunities. opportunities, so equity, opportunities, mission. Future flexibility. And the future that keeps coming back, right? Hmm. One of the things we did when I looked over here, we started <coughs> trying to boil this down a little bit, was that from a student view, relationships matter. Students will be, it's, it's short-term disruption, but will adapt. The adults won't. From a student's view, we'll be, we'll be okay. And in that, make sure we're looking at the students of the future. Right? From the parents view, equity, if there's two high schools, that opportunities matter and relationships matter. So how are we assuring that there are both opportunities and relationships in either design? And from the public view, long-term flexibility matters, relationships matter, and cost matters. So we saw that emerge from this view, not so much from this view. And yet across all of them, you're seeing, I would offer some of the same things here. Flexibility, equity, opportunities. Is that making sense? No? Yes? So what we're, what we're going to do is I'm going to put up, um, we're, gonna, we're recording all of this stuff that was up here. We're recording this, and what we'll put up, if this makes sense, is start putting up statements of consultation that start at this level, like point number one, get the referendum passed. Point number eight, that, is that simple? Yeah. Anybody disagree with that? It's a simple it's statement. Right. Yes. It's a simple yeah. statement, but it's not a simple task. It's not a simple task, yeah. right. Right. but it is a simple statement. Make the referendum pass. I want to disagree with that, actually. Yeah, okay. I, do too. I, do. I, I don't want it to pass that messes up future possibilities. Yeah. So making sure the referendum passes in my particular instance is is down the list of things. I want the right referendum to pass for academics and for the future. I don't want the school board to pick a referendum that will pass. I think that's a horrible idea and a bad option for the future because that really messes up younger kids, my kids. Right. It gets us all back so in the same. So you're way. saying, you're, what, 
And I'm, this, by the way, is what we're doing, mm -hmm. right? You say, wait a minute, the academics, the academics and the success, right? Make sure the design works well for those fundamental things. And that the package, but the package still has to pass. What I thought I heard Brad talk about yes. was long term. Yep. You have to choose the best solution. Irresponsible not to. Competing against that is, will it pass? Mm -hmm. right. Well, we are trusting that we're going to take all that la la land and unicorns and ideal situation for all our kids and take the best of it and right. bring the referendum that can pass in a positive way. I guess that's what we meant. I will get on board with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to just double check. I'm going to okay with it. I'm so going to say that that's an issue. Starting with La La Land and Unicorns, let's build up. Let's build up the solid academics, equity, opportunity, right? Right, where we pay attention to relationships, but yet at a cost and at a point that we know the community will support. And it will be positive and overall. I mean, we're trusting that they will put all together. I mean, that is what right. this is for, and take the best of it and put it in place to a way that it can pass in a positive way for all of us. And I'll take another statement here that I'm reading through a couple of statements is that make sure that you can communicate the pros and cons of all the stuff so that the community understands. I'm taking that sense that someone said hire a PR firm. And at the same time, if you think about it, we keep coming back to flexibility, equity, opportunities, strong academic, right? There's very consistent themes. So what we're going to do is take a little break, but I will say is that within the next week, you'll be invited to go online like last time. You'll see all of the data, and you'll see it rolled up in a couple statements. And we need people to be able to go on there and say, that makes sense. Okay, I agree. And then the other people said, wait a minute, try this phrase, or think of something different. It was, by the way, at offer, what's very, um, what's very uh, helpful as we look at that is when people offer a suggestion, because when someone says, I disagree, on our end, it doesn't give us anything to work with. I just say, thank you very much. When someone says, I think this is a stronger statement, you go, oh, okay, you're telling me, you're giving me an idea about something to work with. So if you go online, really encourage you to think about what's something that would advance a statement, strengthen a statement, clarify a statement from your view. And then that helps us look at all the different input. Okay, make sense? But you get the, if someone says, what did you do today? I think you can walk out of here. I do like the La La Land and the <laughs> unicorns. <laughs> I mean, you're the, right now you're the savers? Okay, <laughs> Rod's going to get even with me later about that. <laughs> but let's take uh, 10 minutes because we're going to take another view. What we would do with the Guiding Coalition is give you a snapshot on how uh, elections are handled as a school district. And so we have for you some... I think pretty interesting information on what we've what, what's kind of deemed a heat map where it tells you in the referendum vote that failed it will tell you to the household who voted it won't tell you how they voted that would be nice but it doesn't <laughs> tell you that um, but it is a heat map of precincts we'll give you some precinct information so You'll get a chance to look at your neighborhood, you know, to see are the people voting, are they not voting? You know, we've got a city of almost 40,000, and I've got some facts and figures for you that kind of help. It also <coughs> helps you get a, a better sense of what you're up against when you go out for, for a referendum. In a referendum, you typically do three kinds of seeking of information. We've actually started many different uh, methods of gathering information. But the first one you do is what would be like a, where are we at now? So like in, an, in a political campaign before maybe even the, the parties decide who they're gonna run, you see what the temperature is of the community. So we have not started as a community any campaign, educational campaign for any option. 
So what I want to show you is through the newspaper, we have what we use as a poll or a public opinion before you start. Okay? So this I think that's important. The other thing I would say, oh, I suppose I should turn this on. Is how did we come up with this? And I think you're aware of it, but I just want to make sure. <coughs> we took the results as of noon today. Tomorrow, the public opinion part of it uh, ends uh, at the end of the workday tomorrow. We might get some tricklers in on the through the mail and so forth, but for the most part, we were, we were able to get um, things in. Of the newspapers and of the online, there were 1,846 completed completing the survey, and then methodology. I think it's very important that you, you remember in the survey that we gave or the poll we gave, it's a non-scientific. And many, many folks would know that when you conduct this type of a survey, if you had multiple devices, you could fill it out in <laughs> multiple ways. There were ways that you can do these things. Just like when the Democrats, Republicans are trying to figure out who they're gonna run, you might get a phone call from a couple different sources or a couple different banks trying to figure out what, what you're thinking and who you might vote for. That's part of why it's called the early, the early part of a public opinion survey. We don't claim any, you don't go through the tests of validity, the, you know, the credibility, things like that. But it is important to know where you're at before you start. The other piece of that is, um, last time we used a market research company who in Minnesota and in, in cities and in the school district, school districts, uh, that it was the Bill Morris or Peter Leatherman group, they are known as the varsity team in this kind of work with about a 95% success rate. Unfortunately, we're, we were part of the 5%. <laughs> so when you're, when you're part of a 5% and people look at the research survey, you have to have confidence that if, they're going, if you're going to do another scientific one, we made a choice that we're not using the same company. Okay? Even though they are known as the best, we found a national opinion survey, a center for, for the public opinion, who we're going to use. And that will start... Um, shortly. It's going to start, I think, right after Thanksgiving. And you remember on Tuesday the 16th, that meeting I asked you to attend? They'll basically have the scientific survey, which is all telephone, by the way. They'll have that done by the about the 8th of December. And then they'll have what is considered in the business, 94, 95% accuracy rating. And it's based on all the questions that we put together for them to do in a survey. So. We haven't designed the survey, but I wanted you to know that that's the process. So, let's see here. Yeah. What uh, kind of what telephone are they going to be using? Home phones? Well, we we have a, and Sarah's here who does our, our election piece of it, but um, when people register to vote, um, there are telephone numbers used, and there's a district election grouping where they can get the information. So we have that. There's also, um, they do some methodologies that I, I like where you can't just survey parents because they tend to vote a little bit more supportive. So what they'll do is they'll go to the parent group and they'll peel, they'll, which we have a lot of cell phones and stuff for that. And then they'll try to make sure that the demographic match up so you're not just using parents. Uh, they'll go and target specific groups then and the phones that they'll get, I believe, and Sarah, maybe you can help me, um, is the is, there is when you sign up or when you register, you're giving phone numbers. And oftentimes, I believe most of us don't have landlines anymore, so the number we give is our cell numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's where I that's where I'm at with that. Yeah. What if there's more than one person in the same household? For as far as this voter information you're referring to, are they going to ask? all of them or just one person per household? Okay, good question. They'll, they'll ask to speak to the person they need to speak to based on their demographic methodology. So 
they need to make sure there are so many people that fit the demographics of Shakti, so many that are registered, so many that are women, so many that are men, so many that are coming from certain economic <coughs> households. It's all the stuff that make up the, the Shakti community. Okay. So here is, uh, yes. <coughs> there were a number of people that got missed in the last, uh, in, in, during the last election or during the last referendum uh, during the phone survey. And I know you kind of talked a little bit about that, but uh, you, know, you made one statement just now that a lot of people don't have landlines. I don't think that's a correct statement. Um, we still have a landline. I know most of our friends still have landlines, and yet we were skipped over during the, uh, the, the phone survey for the last sure. referendum. Statistically, you would be, right? Because there's 40,000 people, and they might call a couple thousand people to but get to the In addition to that, we also have cell phones that are registered yeah. with the school. My wife has a cell phone. I have a cell phone. And now currently my son has a uh, cell phone, all reg registered with the school. Mm -hmm. So. How are they going to oh, that? So did I, if I said re the registration part is when you register to vote, not that you're registered as a school, that your kids are there. Mark? If I could answer, because yeah. we're going through the same process, the city's going to be doing a scientific survey. When you hire one of these professional firms, they have access to your cell phone number. I mean, it's scary what information is out there. <laughs> so in any case, as long as you're one of the if they have a sample of 400, uh, they'll find you, whether it's your landline or your cell phone line. Sometimes, though, what, what was interesting <laughs> is that 70% of the people that answer the phone are women. And that's just one of those, as long as you're up, why don't you get it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 and what, and what they end up doing, then, is so they don't get 70% women respondents on that, they will ask for the person whose birth date is closest to that particular date, and that's how they get the randomness in there. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to move forward then with the, the public opinion uh, piece of this. So the first question, if each of the following <laughs> options today was the only choice on the referendum ballot, how would you vote? So here is an addition to the high school. There were 66% that said they would vote yes. And remember, you could vote more than once. On a 1,600 student, second campus, but one high school, 46% said they would vote yes. 1,600 second high school, 40% said I would vote yes. 3,200 student, altogether new high school, 31% said they would vote yes. Sure, sure. Probably a lot more of a billboard than a post. I wasn't going to make a comment. <laughs> 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 one, one comment, just uh, maybe it's my editorial comment because I'm a kind of a social scientist nerd, is um, there is, according to this public opinion, question one, only one option that cleared this first question, which is the 1600 student addition. I don't want us to talk yet what that we think that means, because that's going to be your table talk exercise, is to help us think about what that means. Okay? The next one is, if you had a preferred option, and I think I mentioned earlier, you actually, some folks couldn't live with one prefer, preferred option, so they picked two preferred options. But uh, which is your preferred option to solve the crunch? 1600 student edition had a 43% preference, 17% for the 1600 student second campus but one high school. The 1600 second high school came in second with 26%. This was the 3200 student new high school, 13%. And then none of the above and or which one might assume they weren't interested in any of those by that response, but we don't know because we don't have follow-up questions. And you can see here that um, you, have, you start thinking about, as the board needs consultation, how many options do we bring forward in the professional market survey? 
Do we allow, does the board allow all four to be fleshed out? Do you start shrinking it down? You know, those are things that we would benefit from hearing your opinions about tonight. <coughs> Amenities. Uh, you know, there's some ranking here. So we asked folks and they could check a rank um, as far as they wanted to go. Uh, top five choices. Again, some had to go more. Uh, so one would equal the most preferred. So what we did here is of the responses from our community members of five, so 500 people or more said these are in their top five wish list or desires. The first one was the district-wide safety security. It received, oh, well, 915. The sheet of ice, 786. Sports dome, aquatic, the deferred maintenance, a new stadium, indoor activity intramural field house, improvements at Vaughn Field, and then a six station field house. Okay. One thing I would point out is the city of Shakopee and the district have had two sub have had a sub joint subcommittee meeting, um, <coughs> several meetings actually, to figure out as a community what are some of these things that the city <coughs> might want to do. And what are some of these things that the district might or should want to do? And I would also be interested at your table in hearing your opinions that if the city would go forward with some of these items and perhaps some of their own, uh, would, would you believe, for example, uh, we've talked about sheet of ice for a long, long time. If the city would go forward and perhaps do sheet of ice, does that have a beneficial factor to the to the Shakopee community or does that do damage to the possibility of a referendum passing in Shakopee we'd be interested in your guiding consultation on that or any other opinions you might have and we certainly would whatever you have to share with us would, would be great so we're going to shift now to voter <coughs> First of all, it's not done, because that, that's tomorrow. Okay. So you're, are you asking, can you look at the Excel spreadsheet that we kept these on, or? Well, just the total votes of, 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 you know, how many votes came in for this, how many votes came in for this, how many votes came in for this, for each, each of the items on the ballot, on the, or, not, sure. or on, the, uh, on the survey. Sure, so what we'll take is, I think we had 45 of the amenities. I have an official board report Monday evening and you'll see each one of these in a spreadsheet format that will start out at 915 and it'll go down 45 places to maybe 10 votes or whatever the least popular one was. So yes, we'll, we'll have that and we'll put it on uh, the board agenda and the web. <coughs> okay. Uh, here's, here's what's interesting about, about voting. Um, so in Shakopee, there's approximately 22,568 registered voters. In an election where we were going after a two high school approach, which you know you really can't imagine uh, either controversial, legacy, for right or for wrong, anything more that gets people excited, we only had 22% of the population of registered voters vote, 5,058. And I think for those of us who kind of enjoy the political thing and the political world, you kind of wonder why, how come, you know? And how come when this is so fired up, how come people don't show up? And, you know, it's a bigger issue than what we have tonight, but, um, you know, and then we looked at, to the parent thing, we had about 2,250 parents in the March election, and we have about 9,300 parents or guardians as a whole. So if you look at the, a lot of times you'll hear in referendums, and we just had a bunch of them pass in Minnesota, You'll hear the comment, well, our parent groups or our parents helped swing the vote or pass the vote. In this election, I'll let you make the judgment you want, but think about 2250 out of a potential 9300. And I'd be curious about, I mean, clearly we screwed up on the, on the one, one common site and the ballot and stuff like that. So get that, I, I know that, that was a screw up. 
If there's other things, though, that you think about as to why our parents didn't vote, that would be interesting for us. Then, this would have been the first time your sons or daughters who turned 18 could have voted in, in the election. And we had 72 out of almost 400 high school seniors um, who voted. So only 18% of the senior class voted in that election. And there might be some feelings or thoughts that you would want to share with us about that. And then um, employees are another typical group when it's a referendum who vote. And this one, we had 342 out of 504 eligible, meaning they actually, you know, they live here, so they're el eligible to vote. About 68%, and for some you might think that's high, for some you might think that's low. If you have any thoughts or comments, we'd like to hear that as well. Um, I'm gonna have the lights go back on now. Here is, um, I'm gonna have Sarah and Crystal start handing out these materials. We have, on what's called a, a heat map here. This, and remember, this is not the most recent election. This is the one that failed. This identifies the homes that had a vote in it. So at the Poss House, uh, Dave, if Dave voted and everybody in his family voted, it'll show up as a red dot. So it's not, when you think about this, it's just, or even, if it's an apartment building, you might get one red dot and there might have been maybe hundreds of people that were eligible to vote. So the yellow dots are our um, school district kinds of buildings to give you some, some vision on, on what this looks like. I would also at your tables, when, when we take a few minutes to talk about it, we hear a lot about who we think is out there voting. I'm curious because as, as a group, should you decide that you're going to be part of whatever the board, oh, excuse me, that whatever the board has to say and, and puts on a ballot, this helps you understand who voted in that last piece. We also broke it down so you could find your friends and neighbors who, who vote or don't vote. Uh, you can see on here the number of votes cast by precinct. And I think that you might have an interesting you might have an interesting few thoughts on who's voting, why they're voting, why they're not voting, what skin in the game do they have. In fact, you might find that that interesting. So, um, if if you would do this, take two minutes of just your own private reflection time to take a look at the heat maps and the precincts and so forth. Then after you've taken that two minutes, just do a simple turn and talk to the person next to you, or if you decide as a table, I'd like you to formulate some comments about, to the, to the larger group, some general comments that uh, I've asked um, Dennis to help us guide through. Does any of this information do anything to your statements of consultation. Does it chip away at it? Does it make it stronger? Does it, you know, does it have any impact? Okay. So take two minutes of private review, and then please take two more at your table, and then I'm going to turn it, have Dennis come back.
school don't have a sense for what this is all about. In other words, the older people, some of the people that were emotionally attached to this vote referendum to vote against it, they really don't have a sense for how crowded the schools are. Yeah. So that that might be a, just a, a clarification about just communicating the real the real need because yeah. some may not be connected. They don't have the experience of what crowded looking feels like, right? That's a, he's making an assumption that might, yeah. That the older people are the ones who voted for the... No, I don't think he means, no, I don't think okay. the statement made was that uh, the older population not being in the schools don't feel, don't know what crowded means. Yes, look at precinct six, which is 600 voters. That's an old shocker. Okay, other statements about these tables in here. Statements, either of shifts or new statements. One thing I would say is, uh, you know, traditionally, if a, if a city had two schools, two high schools, they're usually like a divided one, right? And we have a lot of different neighborhoods. I know, you know, you live on the far east side, you know, we go to the west. How, how is that dividing line? Is there going to be divided, okay. or is it going to be So I'm going to phrase that is, well, the, the question is, is that with a two high school option, how do you frame boundaries? Right? Because the dividing line is a boundary. Or attendance zone. Or don't you? Or don't you? That's a different thing. So two high schools, attendance zone <laughs> or not, might give you a different picture from a voter perspective, right? Okay. Because as a community, you've never had a line. Well, we know, and it's interesting because the two high schools, the two plots of land, are so close yep, to that's so. Yeah, you're not over here and over here. You're right there, right? Comments? I would say the two takeaways that I had from looking at this map are, one, proximity to polling place was really important, and then B, um, that the minority communities of Shakopee did not vote. I think to elaborate on that point, I think proximity to polling place was rather poor. There was one polling place, and that was pretty much right in the center of uh, you know where everyone is is congregated. I think we could have brought in a lot more voters if we had. Two, three, four, four. So the, places. I think what you're saying is, is that the voting, what's the strategy behind the voting places? Right? Say, say, that, other, again, please. No, say that again, please. This, what you're talking about is that polling places, the strategy, the location of polling places may matter. Yeah. Right? Good question. One. 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 Well, let me take it back to two because of the township. Yeah. yeah. So really the yellow dots are the buildings. Those are school buildings. Side buildings. Building. Yeah. Yeah. Yellow dots are school buildings, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you had, you had two polling places. Mm -hmm. And for the to be real, we had one because yeah. the township, yeah. you know, 99% of the population. Okay, you had one polling place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you have one polling place, you have 30,000 people. That doesn't really make for, you know. But that might be, that's a new, that's a, the location and the number of polling places. You might want to, mm -hmm. hey, might work. But, but to be fair to the schools, isn't that typically the way that school on referendums were done? Just because of cost savings, turnout isn't really high. That's the way it usually works. And but if that's the way it usually works, maybe we should look at if turnout's not high, because there's only one polling place, maybe we should look at that and say maybe we ought to have a couple more polling places but and see what happens. It's easy to see why the school district did what they did because historically that's the way it worked and it was never a problem. But this time, I think you had to admit it was a problem. They get it. They get it. They get it. They get it. So possibly going forward, we can okay. look at increasing the number of polling places to bring in more people. We got it. Okay. Statements. Think about. It.
one dot could represent 100 votes or one, you know, one vote. It doesn't tell really the whole story. So the, be careful about what you take away and what you keep in. So other, other statements of what might shift what you thought about or said earlier or something new? There's two things that I look at. When you said that uh, 500 and something eligible employees are those the school eligible employees? School employees. Well, but we we'll have to make sure that they do, all eligible employees should vote. There shouldn't be a gap in there because there's no excuse. And the other one, when we look at the parents of 9,300 parents, we're looking at just the fact that they're parents, mm -hmm. but like we're talking about maybe 30% of that and even more can legally vote. And some of them, even though they're residents and they pay taxes, they can still, they can't they vote. Can't vote. So if you look at the places, like somebody was saying, or you were saying too, like for example, the uh, Jackson Township or those places where you see less voting, is because most of the people in those areas are mostly immigrants. So it does make sense that the, that the voting is lower, but at the same time, like we cannot rely just because you're a parent, you can vote, and at the same time, just because you didn't vote, it doesn't mean that you're not invested or wish to vote. So that is three things. But I think what you're, the point that you're making is that you can't offer the assumption that a parent is an eligible voter. Yes, right? just if but, parents yeah. have the ballot. Right, and then number two, you might think about how do you get more parents and staff members to vote? Mm -hmm. Because the numbers are there. How do you differentiate between parents and staff members? How do you know how many staff members voted? As far as I know, in, the, in our nation, our, our, our voters, our, you know, our voting is a secret ballot. How do you know how many staff members are? I don't, you, you don't know you how. You don't know how they voted. You don't know how, how, they they voted. Voted. Know how, how many. many. How? Many. how? Uh, I know if you voted. I look up your address. Yeah, you yeah. voter you you voter how they voted. Voted. No, you know voter history. You know the Secretary of State. Yeah. 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 If you voted or did, there's lots of data on if you did or not, but right. what you voted, how, how you voted. How you did. Okay. Other statements, yes. So I think it's there's a table had a discussion about the importance of really recognizing this survey for what it is. And I think Dr. Thompson made it very clear that this is not a scientific random sample. So when you look at roughly 8% of the people who are eligible to vote did this survey, who are the people of enough interest in this vote that did the survey is a huge question. And I think the results that you get through your scientific surveys that do a real random sample and try to cross-represent all those of interest for voting will give us a better So maybe if I can take, recognize, this is a new statement, recognize it's a non-scientific, right. right? And the scientific survey is gonna get you probably more of a qualified view. So this, this is, gives you some interest in. Although I would like to point out though that if you took the time to vote in the survey, you're likely to vote in the election too. Correct. Yeah. But so you're gonna get, but those people are all gonna vote. But we wanna get more than And, and you have to take a look, this is not a comparison, but you have to take a look. So it's worth a, a, an area, and they were a percent of a group of people. Well, how many people will vote? This was last week, next Tuesday. And they said, oh, about 80, 85%. And I said, no, no, no. And I said, no, off your election, about 80 to 85% of our town votes. On your election, we're 95 to 97%. And I went, really? I said, yeah, we're always number one or number two in the country. I went, Oh, so when you talk about how many people vote and you look at the percentages, realize it's really cultural because you can go not that far <coughs> away and the people, oh, 70, 80% voting is always, always happens. So I think that's a, and often it's a question you have to think about, about, about the actual number of voting because the 22 to a 50 or 60% voting, the numbers just completely change. But Dennis, there's a difference between having an off year vote and having just a standalone thing that we did here. No, I'm, I'm not talking about the timing. I'm just okay. talking about the raw numbers and the, the voting culture. Other key points? I think the, um, the, the information 
information provided by some of those responses in terms of what you would likely vote for on the option, I think is really important because of what we saw up there, right? Yep. So most of the votes were going towards the expansion of the existing high school, which for most people in this room thought that that doesn't bring flexibility for the future. And so I think that's probably an important new statement in that the survey responses are saying that and that presents, I think, this room with a new challenge because for us in this room, we're seeing that as limiting flexibility for the future, but our voters are saying that that's a likely option. So, but, <laughs> well, if, and you're gonna do another survey, but you need to balance that out. And you talked about, um, I think most of us are able to put this in, we felt that perhaps the next survey we should have follow-up questions regarding the budget. Yeah. Especially, uh, the, especially the add-on to the current okay. high school, what that means to me. <laughs> Frame the question in such a way, would the 60% be in favor of that option to do it the same way? Even if they do it in 10 years, the next still wouldn't be cost quite as much. Would they feel the same way? I think we'll give them multiple. Uh, <laughs> so I think the follow up questions was really so, what we were, we talked a lot about was follow up questions. So follow up questions survey. to get a deeper understanding, right. knowing what some of the. So I'm going to, and this might not be accurate. Uh, but what you're saying is that the informal survey gave you some data that pushed right against one of your limitations, right? And you're like, hmm. And then you're saying, well, wait a minute. Also, the follow-up sur survey needs to have critical follow-up questions so that the board and the community can get the real, the deeper information right. it needs. Because this is not, I just thought that, this is not just a simple, oh, this is what we should do. It's complex, and there's many layers to it. Two things, Dennis. Well, one piece of that might, um, that high representation on the addition to the existing high school might be in part of the understanding that when the high school was built, that it could be a mega high school. In the context of the conversation, as I recall it at that time, was more like the Dean Curry and folks not necessarily understanding that if you add on, this is probably the end. And so there might be an educational component about if that is indeed true, that folks understand that part. Right. The second part that I wanted to say. In here at the facilities action team, you're more informed as to the longer range of the flexibility issues. True, and so there yeah. just might be a public Education. perception about that. Um, the, the point that I wanted to make, and there was an article in the, education would be, yeah. in the Shakopee Valley News about our diversity um, and how much it's changed 16% since the census was taken in 2000 and now they're reporting that it's 29%. Um, that brings different challenges as far as how we outreach to our entire voting population or potential eligible voting population and how you reach um, folks of, of different ethnicities is different than maybe the community has traditionally faced um, you know, with, with less diversity. So and then that might, so that might not only more education need to understand the need, but. Um, what are the avenues to reach out to different ethnicities? Yeah, what's the engagement strategy of, of different communities other than the traditional? I might say, what's the engagement strategy? So think about that if you really want to have engagement and have voting and participation. Yeah, that might be down here, right? What you did. So, okay, any other key statements? And just so you know, yes. Uh, we talked in our group about how people wanted to know that innovation <coughs> was possible. And just because it's possible doesn't mean it's feasible. <coughs> and that's kind of, you know, that the facilities team came to the conclusion that it's possible and they forwarded us the four possible options that could be <coughs> considered. But our job is to decide is it also best option that we sure. could get behind and we have to balance that with just because this opinion says that's what most people would choose if they have four options to choose from 
So I'm going to frame that, that the, the, the board needs to grapple with all these variables and decide what needs to go on the ballot. And number two, I'll go back to a comment made earlier, you have to recognize this is an informed, non-scientific survey. And it, and it wasn't, it was what, 8%, right? Roughly, Roughly about 8%. So you got, and then someone else made the point that if they did, it might be those that are more likely to be engaged in the vote anyway. Okay, that, that's a view. And then I'm hearing from others, but wait a minute, we better not only educate the public about the options, but also about the key issues, the variables, and then how do we reach out and engage new communities, right, that really are gonna be impacted because it's gonna be a different population uh, that, that live and vote here than maybe did 10 years ago. Things have changed. So again, what we're gonna do is pull together, uh, and I, I would just offer that some of these new statements specifically are offering a little bit of a twist that didn't come up earlier in the conversation. And so we're gonna to try to um, capture this and you'll probably see some influence of these statements in on the, the other ones that are over there. And again, it usually takes us about a week to kind of sit down and go through all this and capture some statements and then you'll get notified by email to go online because that's what you might find with it. Do it online, right, the link. And really encourage you to do that and we will let you know the date that we need to have feedback by so that we can consolidate these and advance these these statements of consultation to the board. Okay? So Dennis, one, over. one, not yet, one yeah. question I would like to hear in Bradwood as well. You know, the city has talked about doing some projects within the community. Oh. Uh, the district has talked about doing some projects. That's what people were asked in the survey. <laughs> One of, the, one of the real possibilities that we, we've heard in this community over a period of time is the need to make more options for from little kids all the way up to our senior citizen. So the city and the school district through the subcommittee talked about beginning perhaps with ICE where the city builds ICE and the district is a, a leases from the city at a, at a rate that, that makes sense to everybody and makes an investment into that. And then going forward at some time, either sooner or later with whatever else the city has within their intentions from a, you know, a number of things, from sports bubbles and things that we happen to have on our list. So my question, and I don't wanna to take too much time. Okay, my question is, is do you think it will hurt us if the city would build ice, make a commitment to build ice, and then let's just say they make a commitment and they talk about it in November, December, and by March, they, they say, done deal, we're doing ICE. And then in May-ish, because the board hasn't decided which one of those dates you advise us on, but in May, then we vote on the school referendum. So I would like to hear if you have an opinion, does finally getting ICE for the hockey community and our broader community help us or hurt us as, a, as the referendum would go? I would. Okay. Just, just, I think it would be helpful if people just, you, you just want to hear people's response. We do, yeah, I think the board would like to hear yeah. people, and so would the city. Yeah. <coughs> just go ahead. Well, may, may I ask Mr. Tapke then where the city plans to get the money to build the sheet of ice? Uh, <coughs> Can well, you we're give, talking can you give about the yeah, short no, version. Maybe that would be helpful to know that I, you're not talking about referendum. You're talking about some other. Well, mechanism. I know, but you know, we're talking about referendums for amenities and for the school. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, instead of uh, the sheet of ice being an amenity tacked onto the school, all of a sudden okay. the city's going right, to pay for it. What we're talking about right now, we just had a recommendation. We had a facilities task force between with two um, folks from the school board, two folks from the city council. And the recommendation from that group that has been meeting, and I'm not one of those four, uh, the recommendation that came out of that group was to look at a range of amenities for the community center. Um, as Rod said, it will help needs that we have in the community from really early childhood to uh, seniors and, and the entire range. So um, sports facilities wise, what we are looking at are sheet of ice, indoor, outdoor aquatic center, 
field house type facility with indoor turf, um, probably sport courts kinds of things, and having an, an indoor field house. And this is all at the community center as it is. So these are additions to the community center. Um, improving our fitness center. Um, and, and what else? Did I miss a second? There's one to a playground. An indoor playground, exactly, as, uh, as a part of the field house. But to really um, improve that range of things. At the same time, um, taking and partnering with the school at Central Family Center for working on um, getting a senior center, multicultural center, um, and a teen center at there, which with opportunities with a partner with a lot of different folks. We had at our meeting, we've got a theater group uh, beyond the Yellow River. We've been talking about Scott County. We've been talking with a lot of different partners to come together to do this, um, to get this done, and to answer your question there. Um, me, we will not be having a referendum to do this. The city has um, a lot of money and funds that we'll be utilizing, as well as doing bonding and taking on debt at that point. Um, this does not need to be referendum, uh, does not need to be passed referendum wise. So it's all in the discussion and concept phase at this point. We're going out to do a, a feasibility study. Um, we're going to vote on doing a feasibility study or not on uh, November 18th, and we'll decide how to move forward from there. So this is not a council recommendation yet, it's just working together to figure out the possibilities. Thank you. Well, yeah. I guess, so, uh, Rob, so Rob, so Rob yeah. the original right. question. I think that question needs to be directed to the hockey association and the families there. Because my kids don't play hockey, I don't vote on the referendum whether it includes ice or doesn't because it's a concern of mine. Um, I think it's hard to say if it will hurt or help you. I, I don't know. That's you're talking about the users of a facility that are a relatively small portion of the population. Um, yeah, thank you, Gary. I, I would Other think point? That as, as a hockey parent, I would think that within the hockey community, it would it, it couldn't hurt you to have a past ankle injury. I'm assuming you're asking because you're wondering if maybe because people have seen this action, they're going to go out from the city side. That yeah, for a number of reasons, it could upset people right. and. Mm -hmm. Before a referendum, you don't want to upset people. You want to yeah, try and get to build community. But if it's not a referendum, I mean, but if it's not a referendum, well, but but there's there's still still a referendum then the money has to come from the city. And uh, you said, Mr. Cassidy, just now, the city has money, a lot of money coming from different sources. Well, these sources come from the people sitting in this room and other people around the community and the city and businesses. Mm -hmm. Where are these sources? Where, where where is this big surplus the city has that they can afford to? I'm not going to go into all the details right now. It doesn't yeah. make any sense to do it well, now, so but we'll, it'll move yeah, well, forward. Rod, Rod's looking for some feedback, you know, about that concept well, and you brought it up. Or else, city has the money to do this. Go ahead. I, I would like that to hear where this money comes minutes. from. Go ahead. I think that anything that the city can do to to help uh, will lower the cost. But one thing about knowing where the money comes from, like I don't think it would be as as important the fact that we have it and maybe we can have a good usage of it. Another thing is that there's so many um, organizations across Minnesota, like the Metropolitan Council, uh, for example, they are doing, right now I know that they're doing a research among uh, Scott County, Carver County, to find out what is the needs and usage and how the community and the diversity that everybody mentioned like have changed so much and maybe we need different kinds of parks and recreations like for example do we have a lot of Hispanic community do we need soccer fields because maybe we don't have them so I know for example in November the 20th there's a research meeting with people uh, of this area to find out what do we need and how places like the Metropolitan Councils can offer grants which I guess is one of the ways where the money come from you know, that we can apply into those things. So if we take care of some things with some grants and things that we can use for, then maybe the school district can take care of other things like the extra sheet of ice. So we take a little bit of the resources that we can with the people who are willing to give the money and just apply to the best of our abilities. So other, I, I don't dispute what, point. I don't dispute what the needs or wants are. I'm not disputing what the needs are or what the wants are. What I am disputing Isn't there a concern? Anyway, about the school district providing ice 
Yeah, we wouldn't buy ice. I would okay. really want you to walk away knowing that. Yeah. We would. the The idea would be is we would we would be the a good user of it like we are now. Right. So, so wasn't there something about it being difficult to put that in the referendum already? Yeah, and I would. Thanks for asking that. We don't have the school district would never have any intention. We don't have any intention of right. building ice. We've talked about some of the things like a dry land or some t team rooms that are like our athletes use and the city doesn't build those kinds of things. So yep. we've talked about that. But the ice itself would have to be a city project. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was so just, I wanted it was to, the that can't go in the referendum. Yeah. No, we, okay. it could. It, so for disclo okay. full disclosure, it could. We're not going to do that from our angle because cities are the one, cities, counties, and other boosters are the ones who typically do that. What you're thinking is if you had something that said we will build a sheet of ice, you're thinking would those people come out then and vote for mm -hmm. schools that didn't include it? And since it already doesn't, that's something that, you know, obviously with 900 and some people voting that it's number one, it would come out. Is it okay? So okay. I'm just Thank, yep. Cut Thank it off. You. Thank you. <laughs> so we move to close. And yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to introduce Scott Swanson for FOES, the next steps. Uh, we'll be sending you the invite for the 16th, and on that night, the, the people and the organization will be physically present to give you the, re the scientific results. And we, will, we would envision putting you in seven tables after the results, each one with a board member. The board members have been in listening mode. That evening, they're going to be in listening and in, and in exchange mode. Then in January and February, it's a legal requirement that you have to have so many days before to put, you know, the, to put it in the paper. I think Michael Hoheisel shared that with you. We, the board has to vote in January in a first reading, February in a second reading, if we're gonna do it in March, which, or excuse me, May, like we're talking about. And then that ballot would be set in February. That ballot, remember, can include one option for student uh, space, but we can do a number of options on amenities and it could be packaged all in one. It could be students and then uh, a sports dome or a technology levy, et cetera, et cetera. It can be a whole bunch of things. So I'm anticipating once you're done on the 16th, we're going to be asking some folks to help us formalize what that ballot question looks like too. So you may never be done with us, is what I'm saying. So, so that's our plan going ahead, and I would like to wrap it up with Scott Swanson, uh, our, one of our school board members. Okay, I don't want to be the guy standing between you and getting out of here, so I'll make three quick points. <coughs> one being that feedback is a gift. So everybody in this room has provided multiple gifts to the school board. So on behalf of the school board, I want to say thank you for the gifts that you've provided. One of the things that sitting in a listening mode has required is it's required us in, on the board to shut up uh, and open our ears. When you open your ears and you're not getting ready to do this to ask the next question, you can actually take in what other people are saying, that whole active listening piece. So this entire opportunity with not only just this body, but also the facilities action team has created that opportunity for us to actually listen, to take it in and listen, which again, that in and of itself is a <coughs> So thank you for that. And you can thank your folks on the, you know, your action team uh, buddies for that as well. The third thing is that um, there are a number of us that were a part of this process back in 2010. Back then there was, I think the group started with like 24 and it was all said and done. There might have been 17 of us, I think, survivors that made it through. Um, we are now not done with this process. But to this point, now here we are at 20, we're almost uh, looking at 2015. Instead of 24 people that got down to 17 having to try to carry a banner or, or, or get out to the city and get people to understand what we know, what we learn, what we understand, we now have 100 and something deputies, ambassadors, if you will. You all have a piece of information that is going to help whatever goes forward, all this stuff. You know stuff that other people don't know now. My ask of you would be wherever this goes, the worst thing I think we could do is let all of that information go by the wayside. So information, uh, it's, it's not like candy. If I give you my information, I, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not out anything. Information is something we can share. So let's share it, pass it forward, and then let's keep in mind that when the school board gets together and we actually assess all this great stuff, 
and we're looking at the boxes and checking the boxes, the boxes that have to be checked first and foremost are the ones that affect the kids, right? Me, my box doesn't have to be checked. I'm hoping your personal box doesn't have to be checked. It's the students' boxes that have to be checked. And I think if that is one way we can start this process, then quite frankly, wherever we end, everybody's going to win. So for that, thank you very much. Give yourself a round of applause.